February 7th, 2007, Florida. Anna Nicole Smith, the former Playboy Playmate of the Year, is one of the most famous models in the world. Anna worked her way from the bottom pretty much straight to the top. The first year of Playboy and guest jeans, she made $22 million. She loved being in front of the cameras. Anna, dance. She loved the attention. Dance, Anna. She's an American icon, a sex goddess with an insatiable dark appetite. I think Anna thought she was invincible. She just didn't know when to stop. She had a lot going for her, and the drugs was destroying every bit of it. Soon, she'll be dead from a lethal cocktail of prescription drugs. This is the last 24 hours in the life of Anna Nicole Smith. February 7th, 2007, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. It's 3 p.m. and Anna Nicole Smith has only 24 hours to live. She's come here to buy a luxury yacht. It's one of the few times she's ventured away from home in the Bahamas since her 20-year-old son Daniel died five months earlier. Going to Florida by the boat was a big deal for her. Another way to kind of maybe move forward a little bit to find a little bit of happiness. Anna Nicole plans on keeping the trip short. She's anxious to return home to her newborn daughter, Danny Lynn. But that plan has quickly fallen apart. For the past two days, she's been too sick to leave her luxury suite at the Hard Rock Hotel. With Anna Nicole in Florida is her bodyguard, Big Mo. She couldn't eat. She was sweaty, very clammy, um, you know, and she, she just didn't feel well. Staying with Anna Nicole in the Hard Rock's luxurious Apollo suite is Dr. Chris Irosevich and her lawyer and close companion, Howard Stern. Big Mo's wife, Tasma, a nurse, is also in Florida. I told my husband, I said, take her to the hospital. If someone's spiking a temp of 105 degrees, something is wrong. But Anna Nicole has no intention of going to the hospital. Every time she's gone to the hospital, press, and, and, and it's been a media frenzy. Uh, she just didn't want to go. She didn't want to go. She didn't want to have the cameras all in her face. Antibiotics and flu medication have brought Anna Nicole's temperature back to normal, but she's still very tired. On top of that, she has an intestinal infection. The combination is making her unsteady on her feet. I was told that she slipped in the bathroom and hit her pelvis bone. Chris and Howard helped her. Chris had told us that Anna had slipped in the tub, hit her head, and she was afraid she might have a concussion. And Chris said she was feeling better, she was laying down. I don't think it was like a hard slip. She wasn't woozy. She knew her environment. She knew who was around her. But the former Playboy Playmate is far from OK. For the past five months, she's been taking a potent and unpredictable mix of prescription drugs, antidepressants, Valium, and sleep medication. There was times where she felt that she sh should take a little more, in which we, uh, those that was there, myself, Howard and Dr. Irosovich would take her away from her and, and hide medication from her. But I mean, she's, she's a woman in pain, not only physical pain, but mental pain. She had a photo of Daniel that she would hug at night and just cry herself to sleep. Barely 39, Anna Nicole Smith is a shadow of the voluptuous blonde who, 15 years earlier, was the picture of health and sitting on top of the world. In March of 1992, in the glossy pages of its magazine, Playboy dropped a sex bomb. Anna purposely was sexy. Anna knew what turned men on. 
She would have this little baby lingo down pat. She just knew how to have this power over men and knew how to give them exactly what they wanted. Breaking the mold of the stick figure models that came before, Anna Nicole was a throwback to the days when big was sexy. Standing six feet tall and weighing 150 pounds, she was the new Barbie doll for 1990s men. After answering a newspaper ad for Playboy magazine, she caught the attention of photographer Eric Redding. The first time that my wife Diva and I met Anna, we were like really taken back. Here comes in this woman, six foot tall, five inch heels. She looked like an Amazon woman. I mean, she was huge. My wife Diva was more taken with her than I was. I mean, she says, this girl's gorgeous. And I'm like, she's so big though. You know, she doesn't look like a Playboy model. And Diva said, I don't care what you say, she's gorgeous. They're gonna love her. In the blink of an eye, Anna Nicole went from Playboy cover girl to centerfold to Playmate of the Year. She posed for the pictures and she came home and she said, God, Mama, that was such an experience. She said, I was scared to death, but it was fun. And <laughs> she said, I really had a good time, but now I'm worried, you know? I hope I get a modeling job. And it wasn't too long after that. A year later, in 1993, her photos caught the eye of Paul Marciano, the president of Guess Jeans. His company's highly sexed up ads had single-handedly launched many of the day's top supermodels. Anna had no clue what Guess Jeans was even about. She had no clue what it was. She didn't even know who they were. She said, they make jeans and everything. And she's like, well, well, I make a lot of money. And that's really how simple-minded she was about it at the time. I don't mean to say country in a bad way, but she, she was country. I mean, Anna was not sophisticated at all. Only 25 years old, Anna Nicole signed a three-year, multi-million dollar contract. When she got Guess, the Guess jeans ad, I, I think she was so happy. I've, I've never seen her that happy. She was just glowing from ear to ear. On national TV, she remade herself in the image of her idol, Marilyn Monroe. America, it seemed, just couldn't get enough of Anna Nicole. The Monroe era, you were fantastic. Well, to me, I, I feel overweight. People, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough I mean, question. To you, you'd like to lose weight? I'd like to tone up. I wouldn't like to lose weight. I'd just like to tone up more. But with her larger-than-life looks, came larger-than-life appetites. Oh, Anna Nicole Smith back in 1991 partied hardy. She could party all night, drink, do drugs, whatever, and she was ready to go. She could shoot on one hour of sleep. If you told her a photo shoot was at 8 o'clock, she may stop drinking at 6, take a one-hour nap, get up, take a bath, and she was ready to go. Be it food, alcohol, or drugs, there was simply never enough for Anna Nicole. She had that personality. You know, instead of drinking one bottle of champagne, for instance, she wanted three or four. Instead of taking one pill to go to sleep, she would take three or four. I mean, if you gave her a box of donuts, she would eat every one of them. Anna Nicole's fondness for excess also included sex. She had a lot of men off and on, and they just didn't treat her how she wanted to be treated, and she felt like that None of the men loved her. And so that's why I think she had a, a, a problem with, with having to go to men and women. Whether it was with a man or a woman, Anna didn't care. She just wanted sex. I mean, she wasn't picky in that respect. She just wanted attention. And Anna craved on that. But what Anna Nicole wanted more than anything was money and fame. She wanted to make big money. She wanted everybody to know who she was. This deep need for love and attention would ultimately destroy Anna Nicole Smith and turn her American dream into an American tragedy. February 7th, 2007, 6 p.m. Anna Nicole Smith is staying at the Hard Rock Hotel Casino Resort in Hollywood, Florida. She's come here to buy a luxury yacht to sail back to her home in the Bahamas but those plans are on hold. For the last two days, she's been so sick with the flu that she hasn't even been able to leave her suite. And in 21 hours, she'll be dead. For the past five months, since the sudden death of her 20-year-old son, Anna Nicole has been under the watchful eye of her friend, 
psychiatrist Dr. Chris Arosevich. Chris was there for her um, through many years, um, different times, um, listening to her, talking to her. But on this particular evening, the doctor has other matters to attend to and has to fly back to her practice in California. The news sends Anna into a panic. She was begging her to stay. She was saying that she didn't know she could make it. She needed her there. But we all assured her that oh, everything's going to be fine. You know, we, you're going to get the boat. We're going to go, you're going to go back to, uh, to the Bahamas. And uh, Anna was just sitting there really depressed about that. After Anna Nicole's death, a total of nine prescription drugs will be found in her body. All of them at therapeutic levels, but taken together, they form a dangerous mix. In her weakened state, their effect becomes even more potent. I personally think that Anna was on way too many meds. That's just, that's, that's, a, that's a fatality waiting to happen. Depressed by Daniel's death, Anna Nicole continues to medicate. All Chris did is help a friend. That's it. If Anna wanted medication, she was going to get medication. It didn't matter if it was from Chris or whoever. One of the drugs prescribed to Anna Nicole is chloral hydrate, a potent sleep medication. It slows breathing to induce sleep, but in combination with the slew of drugs already in her system, it's a potentially deadly cocktail. She was depressed, and uh, she found it hard to sleep at times. And um, at the time, I did not think that she over was overdoing it, although there was some times that I thought maybe you know, she, she could curve it a little bit. With her psychiatrist friend gone, Anna Nicole watches television into the early hours, unable to sleep. Before I went to bed, it was around, I don't know, around 11, 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. Anna was uh, in the living room on the couch. And uh, Howard was sleeping in the bed. And uh, before I turned in, I went over to her gave her a hug and kiss on her cheek and told her, I'm just next door. All you have to do is just pretty much knock, and I'll be right there. But all Anna Nicole really wants is to sleep. She reaches for the most potent sedative on the shelf, her chloral hydrate. This love affair with pills has been going on for more than 20 years, driven by a lifelong desire to escape reality. Anna Nicole's reality began with a difficult childhood in Houston, Texas, where she was born Vicki Lynn Hogan on November 28, 1967. Her mother, Virgie Arthur, was just 16 years old. She didn't see her biological father. Well, um, I wasn't married to him for very long, um, a year and a half, a year and a half maybe. She was three months old when I left him. My Aunt Virgie, she went out of her way to keep him away from Vicky. She would not let him see Vicky because he was not a good man. Hardly a model dad, Vicky's father was a known rapist. After the divorce, Virgie remarried and Vicky grew up with four other siblings in this house on the outskirts of Houston. It's not a real large family, but there was a quite a few kids, and I'm sure she felt attention starved. Vicki loves attention. She loved attention. You know, she was my baby for five years before her younger brother was born. To help support her family, Virgie started working night shifts as a Houston deputy sheriff. With her dad a convicted felon and her mom a badge-carrying cop, growing up was getting a tad confusing for young Vicky, who soon began running wild. She really wasn't rebellious uh, until she got older when she was like 16. Vicky would sneak out of the house and she was into boys then and her mama didn't want her to um, get pregnant at an early age. Yes, I was strict, but I was not overly strict. But did she get her butt whooped when she did wrong? Yes, she did. So did all the other kids. Unable to tame her wild teen daughter, Vicky's mother decided to send her off to live with her Aunt Kay in Mejia, Texas, 400 miles away. But Aunt Kay was no better prepared for the challenge. My mother, she is more of a friend than a mother. She's, I mean, she's just not um, motherly material. 
Starved for positive role models, 16-year-old Vicky Lynn became increasingly aware of her family's dysfunction. She desperately wanted to be anyone else but herself. In Mahaya, Vicky began the process of reinventing herself and her life story. She changed her name to Nikki Hart. And bizarrely, she told anyone who would listen that she was her Aunt Kay's illegitimate child. She had this crazy idea that um, my mother actually had her and her mother just took care of her. I told her, I said, you know, I am your mom. I'm the one that borns you. I'm the one that carried you the whole nine months, took all those beatings from your father. That confusion fuels an endless series of lies, lies that she uses throughout her career, including calling Mahaya her hometown, even though she only lived there for a few years. Anna would uh, change her story for whatever the weather happened to turn. If you listen to Anna, she said that she lived on food stamps and that she had to steal toilet paper and candy just to, to get by. And I asked one time, I said, Vicki, you were not born there. You were not dirt poor. You did not live on food stamps. None of that happened. Why do you tell that? She said, Mama, it, you need to try to understand this. In this business that I'm trying to get in, you have to have a story. She said, good or bad, down or out, Mama. She said, as long as my name is being told across the airways or seen on TV, I'm making money. Anna Nicole's need to escape her own reality would lead to a love affair with drugs, a love affair that in five hours will kill her. February 8th, 2007, 10 a.m., the Hard Rock Hotel in Hollywood, Florida. Anna Nicole Smith has just five hours left to live. On the last day of her life, she wakes up feeling much better, but she's still very weak. Since checking in three days ago, she's been battling the flu. Her high temperature is made worse by another problem, an infection in her left buttock. She just showed me that, you know, that uh, the side of her body was uh, infected. It looked infected. It was, it, was, it was different colors and it was swollen. A yellowish fluid is oozing from an abscess, a pus-filled sac that's been punctured by a needle. For years, in an effort to lose weight and stop the aging process, she's been injecting human growth hormone and vitamin B12. Anna has no discipline. Anna hated dieting. Anna hated exercising. She hated all of that stuff. She liked tacos, uh, chicken fried steaks, uh, anything greasy. During her autopsy, Dr. Joshua Purper, a Fort Lauderdale medical examiner, would discover just how far that obsession with losing weight had gone. You cannot count them. There are multiple sites of injection. Inside the buttocks, we were able to see the abscesses and the needle tracks. Vicky was willing to do just about anything in jeopardizing her health to be able to get the money. The pus is steadily leaking bacteria into her bloodstream. Anna Nicole's body is now battling three things, a flu, an intestinal infection, and blood poisoning. I walked into the room around 10.30, where Howard and Anna was laying. And I said, I'm going to go out. I'm going downstairs to eat with my wife. If you need me, my phone is on. And I looked at Anna, Anna looked like she was asleep at the time. So I went downstairs to meet my wife to eat. No one in Anna Nicole's entourage suspects that her daily regimen of beauty injections is weakening her already frail body. Knowing that she owes her fame entirely to her beauty, Anna Nicole Smith has always been willing to risk everything for her looks. Without her fantasy figure, she firmly believes she is nothing but that very ordinary, very unloved girl from Texas, Vicky Lynn Hogan. 21 years earlier, in 1986, Anna Nicole was a shy, unpopular teenager living with her aunt in Mahaya, Texas. She did not have a lot of friends, Vicky didn't. Um, most of the time, she liked to stay around the house, and she was kind of quiet to everybody else besides family. And we registered her in school, and uh, she stayed with her Aunt Kay, but I don't think she went to school more than about six months. She went there long enough to get her name and her picture in the yearbook. 
as she quit. She dropped out of ninth grade and went to work at Crispy Fried Chicken. By 19, she was married to the fry cook. It lasted less than two years, but out of the turbulent relationship came her beloved son, Daniel. She wanted to be able to support her son and be super mom, I guess you can say. But Vicky Lynn had little to offer. She was penniless. She had no education. She had no marketable skills. With few options, she returned to her hometown of Houston and started stripping. It was something that I never would have thought she would have done. She was raised different. I, I just cannot tell you what a, a horrible thing it was for a mother to see her daughter in a G-string. Virgie Arthur decided to take an active role in her daughter's new career. As a deputy sheriff, she met with Anna Nicole's boss, and she laid down the law. And the manager walks right in, up, you know, and he says, uh, can I help you? And I said, do you see that child right there dancing for that man? He said, yes, ma'am. I said, that is my daughter, and I want her out of here right now, or I will come in this place every night and cause you nothing but hell. <laughs> and he said, yes, ma'am. He said, if you'll just go around to the back door, I will go get her and take her out of here for you. And I said, you got five minutes. But what Virgie didn't realize was that Vicky Lynn had found her calling. No one could convince her otherwise. She was simply going to be a star. She even paid to go to a modeling school, and they told her that she would never be, she would never make a model. Well, she just quit. She quit and said, well, they don't know what they're talking about. I ain't paying them that money. If you told her not to do something, she was going to make it a point to do it just to show that Vicky can do what Vicky wanted to do. When Anna originally started, dancing here in Houston, she was more small busted and was a little bit overweight, so she could only get hired to the day shifts. As a flat-chested 20-year-old, Vicki Lynn firmly believed larger breasts would boost her career. That's all she talked about. She said she could make more money if she had bigger breasts. Even though the implants cost a whopping $14,000, she was more than determined to get them. And after three years of pole dancing and two surgeries, Vicky Lynn finally appeared on stage in 1991, a changed woman, the proud owner of a pair of 42 double D breasts. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> she, they were huge. I mean, they were like three times what her normal size was. And she had so many problems with them. She went back twice, and I think one time they busted in Los Angeles, and so she had to get them put back in there. The silicone breasts were so large that they soon caused her terrible back pain. To relieve that pain, she began to pop pills, a habit that would eventually lead to full-blown addiction. But to Vicki Lynn, the pain was more than worth it. Soon after her breast augmentation, J. Howard Marshall, an 87-year-old billionaire oil tycoon, fell hard for the voluptuous blonde. After just one date, he convinced her to hang up her G-string for good. She called him her sugar daddy. I was just shocked at the age difference. He was really, he was good to her. You know, whatever she wanted, he gave it to her. Whatever it was, didn't matter what it was, he gave it to her. Vicki Lynn's dream had begun. She'd been plucked from the ordinary and placed in a world of wealth and privilege but this would come at a price. She'd do anything that the public wanted her to do, to be what people, what she thought the world wanted her to be. But in 2007, holed up in a hotel room in Florida, Vicki Lynn has nothing left to give the world. In three hours, her short, chaotic life will be over. February 8th, 2007, Hollywood, Florida. After waking early to go to the bathroom, Anna Nicole has been asleep for the past three hours. In another three hours, she'll be dead. At noon, King Eric, a musician friend, and his wife, Bridget, arrive from the Bahamas to help buy Anna's new yacht. King Eric always liked to go in and speak to Anna and everything, and uh, at the time, uh, you know, how I was saying Anna was asleep. So King Eric said, OK, we'll just let her sleep. And that's when my husband asked me to sit in the room with Anna until he came back. Howard had to go and check on their boat. And 
my husband was going to help his brother move. Tasma checks in on Anna Nicole. She's appalled at what she finds. When I walked in the room, it was a disaster. There was a pillow on the floor. Just the, the position of the, of, the, of the covers on the bed, I just, I couldn't really see her. They were all bunched up against her. And the room was like, like a train wreck. The reason why I didn't wake up, because I knew it wasn't unusual or that she would go to sleep at that time of day. This day, it was, this is the thing that, that bothers me more than anything. Every day since I've been with Anna, I've always went over and kissed her on the cheek and said, look, I'll be right back. That day, I just figured I just will see it when I get back. And I told my wife to just to watch her. Anna Nicole is already weakened by blood poisoning and the flu. And no one knows that coursing through her veins is an unpredictable combination of prescription drugs, including an extremely powerful sedative, chloral hydrate. Chloral hydrate is nothing to play with. It's a very strong drug. They don't even use it around the hospitals that much anymore. It's not, it's not widely used anymore, especially outside the hospital. Anna Nicole has been consuming toxic levels of chloral hydrate. The dose which is recommended by doctor is about one or two teaspoons um, at one time, and she took two tablespoons. And sometimes uh, it was reported that she drank straight from the bottle a couple of times. In her weakened state, her dosage is highly dangerous. Unaware of the danger, she continues to binge on the very same drug that killed her idol, Marilyn Monroe. 13 years earlier, in 1994, Anna Nicole had realized her wildest dreams. She was in Los Angeles, living in a house that once belonged to Marilyn. She absolutely loved Marilyn Monroe. She had it in her mind 16 years ago she was going to be the next Marilyn Monroe. Anna Nicole had a morbid fascination with anything to do with Marilyn. She often told friends that, just like her, she'd be dead before her 40th birthday. She had said that before. I want to die naked under the covers, just like Marilyn Monroe, and die on an overdose of sleeping pills. But at 26, death was only a distant thought. Anna Nicole was on top of the world. She was a famous playmate, a guest model, and, like Marilyn, an actress. Everything was going according to plan. The first year of Playboy and Guest Jean, she made $22 million. I mean, she had made it big time. God, girl, I went with her one time. She bought a pair of shoes for $5,000. I said, Vicki, are you nuts? <laughs> I said, go to Payless and buy you a pair of shoes and uh, put that money up and save it. She says, Mother, rich people know. I said, how are they going to know? She said, they can tell. <laughs> I still laugh about that now. $5,000 for a pair of shoes. Vicki was living the high life, and for a while, she took her family along for the ride. Anna Nicole Smith and her mom, Virgie, back when we met 16 years ago, they were a perfect couple. She wanted her mom around. She was very close to her. Whenever Vicki went on a trip, she couldn't stand. She was always in a rush. And so she would always fly one of us down with her, and we would carry the bags through the, through the airport. She couldn't stand carrying her bags. Anna Nicole had reinvented herself. But deep down, she still felt like Vicki Lynn, the unloved little girl from Texas. She told all the family that she wanted everybody to have a tattoo of her put on their body. And if they loved her, they would do that. And I said, Vicki, your mother loves you with all her heart, but there is no way I'm going to have a tattoo put on my body. I mean, she was more like a little kid, like a 10-year-old. I mean, she loved little things like cutting out pictures out of magazines, coloring, I mean, things like that. I think deep down, uh, Anna just wanted to be liked, and she wanted, wanted to like you back. She loved to be loved by her fans. That was something that she couldn't get, what she thought she couldn't get at home. She didn't think that her mom loved her. As her career took off, Anna Nicole shared her good fortune with her family but money would soon become a source of tension. The first Christmas that Anna was able to ever really provide for her family, she got her Aunt Kay Bell a car, she got her mother a television. She was so excited to have Christmas at her house. The sad part, after everyone got their gift, they all left. I mean, everybody 
honestly came, got their gift, and they were gone. And they were probably there 30 minutes tops. She wasn't really generous with the money too much. Um, but she did um, give us money from time to time. Anna Nicole's wealth was spent on a life of excess, and the drugs were starting to take their toll. In February 1994, while partying at the Beverly Hills Peninsula Hotel, she overdosed on a mixture of prescription drugs and alcohol. She was found in her hotel room unconscious and rushed to the hospital. Anna Nicole's dream was beginning to unravel. I didn't know how much she had, you know, tampered with, with drugs. And yet, was it a shock? Yes, it was a shock. The drug scandal sent Anna Nicole's career into a tailspin. Virtually overnight, modeling agencies and their clients stopped calling. All of a sudden, no one wanted America's larger-than-life dream girl, except one man. She called me four days before she decided she was getting married. And she said, Aunt Lane, she said, I've decided to marry Howard. I need you to find a church. On June 24th, 1994, Anna Nicole wed J. Howard Marshall. He was now 89 years old. She was 26. Overnight, the mismatched union turned her into an object of ridicule and created headlines all over the world. He loved beautiful things. She was beautiful. And she needed his support and his income to get where she got. And I, they both knew. I mean, he was not a stupid man. But to the world, she was nothing more than a gold digger desperately after a foolish man's fortunes. Ironically, instead of making her rich, the marriage left her broke. Two weeks after their nuptials, Marshall gave power of attorney to his son, who promptly cut off his father's playmate. After having all this money monthly come in from J. Howard Marshall, it was a rude awakening to her to realize, you know, she didn't have $25,000 a day to blow. Even more so when only 14 months later, Howard Marshall died and a bitter legal battle erupted between Anna Nicole and Marshall's son. She hated going to court, hated it. A lot of things came up, a lot of ugly things, you know, different relationships she was in, different things that had happened. And it was, you know, it was making her really look bad. She hired Howard K. Stern as her attorney, determined to win her share of her husband's fortune. In a short time, Stern became far more than just her legal counsel. I heard that he moved right on in the house with her, and from that point on, you always saw him with her doing whatever it is she needed done. In 1996, with legal costs spiraling out of control, she was forced to declare personal bankruptcy. Stressed out, Anna Nicole began to binge on whatever she could get her hands on. Usually when she gets depressed, she would either start eating or she would start drinking, or both. And uh, she just didn't know when to stop. Within a few years, she'd put on 70 pounds. She'd lost everything, her jobs, her money, her health, and now her looks. When she would get fat and realize that you know, she couldn't work anymore, that just drove her crazy. And I think that's one reason that Howard K. Stern came into her life. He must have promised her that he could turn her around and make her, you know, a star again. With her career on the rocks, Anna Nicole also cut ties with her family. I believe that um, she listened to other people's influence and decided that her family maybe wasn't good enough we were not allowed, and I'm not just saying me, the estranged mother, the estranged family <laughs> was not allowed to be around her, none of us. It was heartbreaking because she had a lot going for her and the drugs was destroying every bit of it. But Anna Nicole Smith had not given up yet. In 2000, she and Howard decided to bank on the one thing she still had, her celebrity status. On the strength of that, E-Television put her up in a mansion and she gave them an eye-opening reality series. It seemed like that their whole life revolved around that show, and the show was actually very, very hurtful for us to see her in that kind of condition. You could obviously tell she was on drugs, and no one could help her. And it was very stressful for us. The last 10 years of her life was, I, I cry when I think about it. You know, she was just an empty shell being controlled. You know, here's a pill, take it and get up and do what you need to do so we can make money and now go back to sleep. 
The show was a big hit. Anna Nicole was now more famous than ever. But within a year, viewers grew tired of watching the train wreck and the Anna Nicole show was canceled. Desperate for money, she became the spokesperson for Trim Spa, a weight loss product. In two years, she lost more than 70 pounds. After nearly a decade of public ridicule, the former supermodel was again looking great. But underneath the curves, Anna Nicole was hiding a dark secret. Her dependence on drugs was now completely out of control. Her drug addiction will follow her all the way to a lonely hotel room in Florida, where it will finally take away her dreams. February 8th, 2007. It's early afternoon at the Hard Rock Hotel in Hollywood, Florida, and Anna Nicole Smith is still asleep in her suite. In just two hours, she'll be dead. Tasma, a trained nurse, is in the same room. She's on the phone to her husband, Anna Nicole's bodyguard, Mo. I had been calling her off and on and asked her how was uh, Anna doing. She said, oh, she's still asleep. Everything seems to be good. I said, OK. Anna Nicole has barely moved since going to the bathroom this morning. As Tasma talks on the phone, Anna Nicole's friend Bridget checks in to see how the sick model is doing. Bridget thought I was talking to Anna. And she came into the room and she said, oh, Anna's awake. I said, no, I'm speaking to my husband. So she came in and she just walked straight up to the bed and she's, Anna, oh, Anna. And she says, oh, something's wrong. And that's when she called me. They notice that Anna Nicole's mouth is hanging wide open. They call her name but get no answer. Bridget starts bending Anna Nicole's foot and gets absolutely no response. And it was at that point that I knew that something was wrong. Toxic levels of chloral hydrate, combined with therapeutic levels of antidepressants, anti-anxiety drugs, sedatives, and flu medication, have brought Anna Nicole's breathing to a stop. Tasma's emergency training kicks into high gear. I opened her airway. I did the little CPR maneuver. I saw nothing. I felt for a pulse. I had got no pulse. Needing help, Tasma hits redial on her cell to get her husband, who's left the hotel to meet his brother. And I told him he needed to come back quick because something was wrong with Anna. And uh, my first reaction is, what are you talking about? He was kind of startled. She said she's not breathing. I said, while you're on your way, dial 911 because I'm doing CPR. And I said, oh, my goodness. And then uh, the phone hung up, and I just started moving. The bodyguard quickly calls Anna Nicole's companion, Howard Stern, who's at the marina. Right away, I said, something's wrong with Anna. Get back right away. I didn't wait for a reaction. I hung up and dialed uh, the hard rock to get 911 on the way. I was driving like a maniac. I don't know who was with me. God was with me. Back at the hotel room, Anna Nicole Smith is in full-blown cardiac arrest. But Big Mo believes if he can just get to the hotel in time, he can save her. And maybe it was the uh, arrogance in me, but I just knew I could bring her back again. He's done it before. Seven months earlier, in the Bahamas, Big Mo saved Anna Nicole's life when she nearly drowned in her swimming pool. I heard a splash. I figured she was kicking the water or whatever. And that's when Howard hollered at me. Whether Anna Nicole's near drowning was attempted suicide or accidental remains a mystery. I saw her floating down about 10 feet. And I dove in, all clothes on, went down, pulled her up, and um, started to resuscitate her and bring her back. Her brush with death followed the most turbulent period yet in her already troubled life. One month earlier, she'd given birth to a baby girl, who she named Danny Lynn, a composite of her son's name and her own. She had wanted a baby girl since she had Daniel. She would go out and buy baby clothes and put them in a hope chest. She had three hope chests full of baby girl things. Two days after the birth, Anna Nicole's 20-year-old son, Daniel, flew to the Bahamas to meet his brand new sister. The very next morning, the greatest moment in Anna Nicole's life suddenly turned into the most tragic. She woke up to find Daniel dead. All of a sudden, her world was just gone. 
And nobody can console her. She lost her son, I mean, someone she's been with for over half of her lifetime. <laughs> Overcome with grief, Anna Nicole had to be sedated before she could be escorted home from the hospital. We would switch visits as much as we could so that somebody was always there. The, the news came and Daniel was on TV and because they were showing all the, the footage all the time and one time she woke up and she goes, see, he's here, Daniel's here. He's just, he hasn't made it yet, he's coming home. A private autopsy later revealed Daniel died of a drug overdose, a lethal combination of antidepressants and methadone. When they had said that Daniel, there was an overdose, we were all completely shocked because he was such a clean cut, just a great kid. Will you release the results of the second autopsy? Uh, I can't answer that question right now. While Bahamian officials withheld the results of their autopsy pending an inquest into Daniel's mysterious death, Anna Nicole's life took on an even stranger twist. She had always refused to name Danny Lynn's father. A host of men had claimed to be the daddy, including an ex-boyfriend, Larry Burkhead. Now, Anna Nicole's attorney sent the media into a frenzy by declaring that he was the father. So you are the father? Yes, sir. Only after her death would a paternity test reveal the truth. Larry Burkhead was the real father. With her son in the morgue and embroiled in a paternity battle, friends watched in stunned disbelief as Anna Nicole and Stern exchanged vows in a bizarre commitment ceremony. When I saw the photographs of Anna jumping off the boat, I thought, okay, she's gotta be on some kind of heavy medication or on alcohol. Then, a month after his death, Daniel's body was finally laid to rest in the Bahamas. Anna Nicole was destroyed. At the grave site, uh, Anna asked to uh, see Daniel. Once the casket opened, all hell broke loose. Anna was uncontrollable. Started trying to get him to get up. She jumped on Daniel, was jumping up and down. I was afraid that, you know, the, the straps that were holding Daniel was gonna give way. It, it came to a point where her psychiatrist was there and he had to sedate her right then and there. With her son's mysterious death, a public paternity battle, and a sudden union all happening within a month, Anna Nicole's life had become a full-blown three-ring circus. Her most private pain had become public, and she relied more than ever on drugs to dull the pain. Soon, those drugs will deliver the final tragic blow. February 8th, 2007, 1.40 p.m., Fort Lauderdale, Florida. In one hour, Anna Nicole Smith will be dead. In the Apollo suite at the Hard Rock Hotel, she's in the throes of a full-on cardiac arrest. Tasma, a trained nurse, tries to revive her. Did CPR for a good 12 to 15 minutes. I was exhausted, but I knew I had to keep going. I couldn't stop. Racing to the hotel is Anna Nicole's bodyguard, Big Mo. Like his wife, Tasma, he's trained in emergency first aid. When I arrived to the Hard Rock, I just drove up to the uh, valet, left it running. Mo came in, he was like, is there any reason that you're doing CPR on the bed? This is not effective. And I said, I couldn't get her on the floor, she's heavy. I tried to pull her two arms, but she was dead weight. Meanwhile, paramedics rushed to the scene. First thing I noticed with Anna was her lips was blue. And um, I knew I had to go to action real quick. So I picked Anna up off the bed. He said he felt a faint pulse, but I, I never got a pulse. And so I just kept on pumping her and pumping her and breathing for her. Mo was doing the compressions and I was doing the ventilations. And eventually he would push me out of the way here and there and he would do both. And that's when I started getting a little bit emotional and I just started screaming her name. I asked her, I said, baby girl, if you got anything in you, please come back. Danny Lynn needs you. I said, forget it, I need you. We all need you. He was very emotional. I've never seen him like that. When paramedics arrive at 1.46 p.m., they use two defibrillator pads to try and kickstart Anna Nicole's heart. Howard came back to the hotel while this was going on. He was just inconsolable. And he, 
He said, Mo, is, what's the matter with Anna? Is she okay? And, I, and all I could tell him was they're doing everything they can. For the next 15 minutes, paramedics tried desperately to bring her back to life. At 2.10 p.m., she's rushed to the Memorial Regional Hospital. But 39 minutes later, Anna Nicole Smith, a.k.a. Vicky Lynn Smith, a.k.a. Nikki Hart, a.k.a. Vicky Lynn Hogan, is pronounced dead. Like her life, Anna Nicole's death is surrounded by controversy. Many wonder if it was an accident or suicide. On the day when she died, she woke up in the morning, so it's clear that she didn't die of a, an overdose which she took the prior night. So uh, implicitly, either she took the medication by herself in order to go again to sleep, or somebody gave her the medication, uh, but the only person who was with her denied that, and, and we could not find any kind of evidence to the contrary. In the end, her death is ruled an accidental overdose. Vicky would not have taken her life, not on purpose or not accidentally. She did not. She had too much to live for. She waited all her life to have that baby girl, and there's no way she would have given that up. They were talking about she couldn't walk, she was running a fever. She couldn't get out of bed to go to the bathroom. She had to be assisted. I mean, how does somebody get up and get medication if they can't even get up and go to the bathroom? Sometimes it comes to me in the form of a nightmare. And I'll wake up, you know, in the middle of the night, and I just sit there and think and, you know, try to figure it all out. She was a woman who loved life, who loved her fans, who loved her son, who loved her daughter, who loved being who she was. Anna Nicole Smith had fought all her life to escape her troubled past, recreate herself, and put her name in lights. And for a brief time, she managed to do just that. This is very hard, very hard. Uh, Daniel was only 20, and Vicky was just 39. I mean, she had a lot more good years to go. She could have been a mother to her little baby girl. While I sat in that room, there was something wrong with Anna. Either she died while I sat in that room, or she died before I sat in there. Why didn't I know this? What happened? What happened to Anna? 